welcome to family worship at home with Mount Zion United Methodist Church in Bennett, North Carolina, and Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church in Seagrove, North Carolina. We're gathered around our YouTube screens today, the first Sunday in 2021. Uh, we have been meeting in person, but due to some possible exposures to COVID, we decided to meet online this day. Here's what you'll need for worship today. We're going to be singing some hymns. The words will be on the screen, so you don't need your hymnal. Uh, we will have a children's time, and so make sure our little ones are gathered around the screen. And also, don't forget your Bible. Open to Joshua chapter 1 in the Old Testament. Uh, the message is entitled, Be Strong and Courageous. A great message to start off the new year. So, if you need that... Uh, to go get your Bible and uh, certainly maybe that cup of coffee. Uh, I'll hit the pause button, you hit it too, and we'll be back in just a second. but she also remembered to bring me a present. And when I opened it, this is what I found. There was paper, I mean, there was paper everywhere. And inside the paper came the box. And uh, I opened the box and let's see, oh, there was more paper and there was another bag inside. And so 
I looked and certainly everything else was wrapped and there was another box inside. And I opened the box and there was another box inside that was wrapped up and I took the paper off it and I brought it out and there was a gift bag inside. And so I looked inside the gift bag and well, gee, there was another box. And then inside the box was the gift, the keychain. That was a lot of work, but it's a wonderful keychain. That's a picture of an elephant that um, elephants are mostly in, in Africa. All of the boxes, all of the paper, all of the tape, all the time and wrapping it all up. My, my goodness. Uh, but the paper and the boxes and the gift bags and all the time she spent, that was not the gift. The gift was this, right? It was what was inside. And that's like the best gift. The first gift that was ever given for Christmas was wrapped up and it was little compared to everything that went on. And his name was Jesus. And his mother Mary put him in swaddling clothes. She wrapped him up in baby blankets and kept him nice and warm and snugly for us. And this is something that we ought to remember for future Christmases. The very best gift that we can give is to tell somebody else about Jesus, the one who saves us, who forgives our sins, and help us to live a better life, and who keeps us related to God, the Father in heaven. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that we can focus on the fact that Jesus truly is the very best gift. Lord, help us to remember that each and every Christmas, that in our gift giving, it's a symbol of what Jesus did for us. We give a gift to others because he gave the best gift to us. We pray in his name. Amen. As we go to the Lord in prayer, you can participate if you will, as I call the names, the first names of the people that we are praying for. You might repeat them or offer your own uh, silent prayer. Let's join together as we pray. For those who are sick and in hospital, uh, Mount Zion related, we pray for Jennifer and Nikki, and Sarah, Nettie, Connie, Phil, Jesse, Ted, Cleo, Carol, Chris, Juanita, and James Lynn. From Pleasant Hill, we pray for Brian and Philip and TH and Phyllis and Ruth and Evelyn and Reverend Pete. Lord, hear our prayer for these who are sick or in the hospital. For those homebound or in nursing homes, Mount Zion, Robert and Betty, Charles, Linda and Larry. From Pleasant Hill, we pray for Ruth and Harold and Ada. Father, hear our prayer for those in nursing homes or homebound. And other requests, Lord, we pray for those who are struggling with COVID. We pray for the healthcare workers and the patients and all of their families, their friends, their co-workers. Lord, this disease not only affects those who get the germ, but those who combat against it and those who support those who are struggling. Lord, we pray for our government, we pray for leaders, we pray for those who are serving in so many different ways to serve humanity, to serve their communities. Lord, we pray for this world. We are in a difficult place right now with race riots and uh, anger and uh, the division that comes even from such uh, little things and some larger issues as well, and differences of opinion on this or that, or in, you know, even in church life. Lord, there is so much division. We pray that your hand would guide humanity. We pray that in all things you would be honored and lifted up. And Lord, we give thanks. We give thanks for your strength. We give thanks for your kindness. We give thanks for the gift of the lives that we live. We give thanks, O oh Lord, for this one day, for the breath in our lungs, the food on our table, the friends who love us, the family that supports us. And Lord, as we gather together as churches, we're not gathering together physically today, but we gather in spirit. We gather to support and love one another. And we do so in the name of Jesus Christ, 
that our lives may be touched and changed and our hearts may be opened and warmed to your work. Father, in all things, we give you praise and thanksgiving for what you have done and what you will do through us in ministry as we apply ourselves. Now, Father, we ask your blessing as we move in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We've come to the time of our reaffirmation of our church's baptismal covenant. If you're not a United Methodist or you're not part of our church family, we invite you to, to use this time as a recommitment to the covenant of your church. Uh, let me take the moment. If you're not a member of a church anywhere and you'd like to be a part of our church, we would love to talk to you about that. And uh, you'll see something about what we agree to as we go through this time of baptismal covenant renewal. So let me invite you, brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and through the spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. Through reaffirmation of faith, we renew our covenant. Declared at our baptism, we acknowledge what God is doing for us, and we affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. We do this with renunciation of our sin and profession of our faith in Christ who removes our sin. Since the earliest times, the vows of baptism of the covenant have consisted first of the renunciation of all that's evil and then the profession of faith and loyalty to Christ. So I ask you, and the correct response for these is, I do or I will. On behalf of the whole church, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? And God's people said, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist injustice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? God's people say, I do. Do you confess Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? And the people of God say, I do. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? God's people say, I will. So let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. And these words will be on the screen for you to follow along and repeat. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And now, if you will, either have your water close or hold it up, if you will, and we'll give thanks over the water first. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time, Lord, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. 
He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare Christ's works to the nations, his glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit, and by this gift of water, call to our remembrance the grace declared to us in our baptism. For you washed away our sins, and you clothed us with righteousness through our lives, that dying and rising with Christ, we may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. This is a, not an act of rebaptism. This is an act of reaffirmation of our baptism. And so we use the water as a symbol, and it is not rebaptizing. As you take the water, as you come close to the water, you might place your hand over it. You might lift some of the water. You might make sign of the cross after touching the water. Uh, however, it is most meaningful for you. Use this sign as a time to remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. Let us rejoice in the faithfulness of our covenant God. We give thanks for all that God has already given us as members of the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We will faithfully participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The God of all grace who has called us to eternal glory in Christ establish and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit that you may live in grace and peace. Go, covenant people, in the name of Christ. Our message this morning is be strong and courageous from Joshua chapter 1. I'm reading the first nine verses. Hear the word of God. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I'm giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you from the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give to them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. The children of Israel had made their share of mistakes. For 40 years prior to this point, they had refused to listen to the godly report of Joshua and Caleb. If you remember the incident, 40 years prior, Moses was the leader, sent Joshua, Caleb, and 10 others into the promised land across Jordan to spy it out and see what the prospects were, what they would face when they crossed the river. When they came back, Joshua and Caleb said, man, we can do this. The other 10 spies were fearful and afraid. And so the people listened to the majority report, not always a good thing, uh, the frightened spies, and they became fearful and they became unfaithful to God's command to go and possess the land of Canaan. So what happened? They wandered for the next 40 years like a man that will not stop and ask directions. Well, 
Meanwhile, the whole generation passes off the scene. And by this time, Moses has died and Joshua has become the new leader. And Joshua does what Moses did. He sends a, he sends a new spy contingent to look over the land. And now, this time, the people do not want to repeat the mistake. They don't want to wander again for another 40 years or worse. And so they're ready to go ahead with conquering what God had already declared was their position. It was a new day. It was a new time to serve. And they were about to carry some important stuff into the promised land. They were going to carry their heritage that stretched all the way back to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They were going to carry memories of Joseph and Egyptian bondage and an ark with remembrances of the wandering in the wilderness around in circles. They were going to carry with them the taste of manna, supernatural food with which God had fed them for 40 years. And in crossing the Jordan into the promised land, they were going to do so wearing sandals that had not worn out for 40 years or their robes. How would you like to have the same pair of Nikes for the next 40 years? Well, with a kind and gentle hand, God had prepared for them a new day. Now it was their time to leave the past and enter their destiny. It was time to cross Jordan River and step into the promised land. There's a lot of parallels, especially on a Sunday like this, the first Sunday of a brand new year. Calendar is flipped over. Feels like a new day, doesn't it? And we're hoping for a better day than 2020, obviously with the weight of the pandemic crisis, the epidemic. It, uh, it's something to look forward to, a new year, and maybe a vaccine that will actually uh, uh, prevent the disease and cure for the disease. So to some extent, God's plan can be seen in a lot of uh, what we think about these days. I believe it can also be seen in the way the United Methodist Church does some things. Just as Moses and Joshua led for a certain period of time, clergy today are itinerant. They're as leaders for a season in churches, and then they move on uh, as the bishop moves us around. Uh, I might remind us, and I'm not saying I'm moving, by the way. Uh, we don't know that yet anyway. But uh, I might remind us that just as certainly as Moses and Joshua were different, they led for specific reasons and specific seasons that God had chosen. And it's always God's decision about leadership. Moses and Joshua were different people. They were different in leadership, but they both pointed God's children to the same promised land. Leadership style should never be confused with God's purposes. Style is simply the difference in human personality, while God's purposes are eternal, immutable, and kingdom-centered. They have nothing to do with the way a pastor parts his hair. Every pastor you've ever met has been different, and that will be the case when God moves me away from where I am and brings somebody else on to lead the churches where I happen to serve. That leadership style will most likely be quite different from mine, as mine was from the people who preceded me. United Methodists, though, are experts at this change of leaders. We've been doing it for two and a half centuries. But the question before the house today is not, not about who the leader might be and what is that leader's style. The question is, how do we as a people enter the promised land of God's favor? How do we do what God wants us to do? Well, this morning, we're going to look at some spiritual principles that Israel observed as God instructed them. Uh, these principles move from exposing and facing our most deepest human fears in favor of serving God so that we can stand firmer than ever in the deepest overcoming faith possible. How to be strong and how to be courageous as children of the Most High God. How to do what God wants us to do. Here are the principles, and there are three of them. They're really simple. Principle number one is you must take a stand. You must take a stand. We read in Joshua chapter 3, verse 8, Give this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop there. Now that kind of stand that's represented here is the stand of faith. 
It's a step of obedience, but it is done in faith. The priests were told to take the ark into the midst of the river. And as their feet touched the edge of the river, the waters rolled back as they had 40 years prior to the Red Sea. Remember, Moses held up his staff and the Red Sea parted and the children went over on dry ground in the midst of the sea. This was a revisiting of that power of God to be visible for all the people of God, to have their faith strengthened. Notice, notice that the priests stood firm on dry ground, according to uh, chapter 3, verse 17. They stood on firm, dry ground in the middle of where the Jordan River was flowing. Now, firm stand is not belligerence. It's merely a step of confidence that God's way is best, and you're going to do God's way. You're going to do things God's way, no matter whom it may please or displease. No matter who may be the leader in your church or in the church that I serve, no matter who may be the leader, take your stand for Christ. You don't serve a leader, you serve Christ. You serve the God of the ages. Principle number one is you have to take a stand. Principle number two is you have to teach that stand to the next generation. We find in, uh, in chapter four, the first three verses, that the people were teaching the stand. When all the people had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, now choose 12 men, one from each tribe, tell them, take 12 stones from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan. Dry ground, rocks all around, take 12 stones. Carry them out, pile them up at the place where you will camp tonight. We will use these stones to build a memorial. In the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? Then you can tell them, they remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. Then you can tell them, this is where the Israelites crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the river right before your eyes, and he kept it dry until you were all across, just as he did at the Red Sea when he dried it up until we had all crossed over. When's the last time you spoke with your children or grandchildren about the meaning of the things that we have uh, that remind us of God? Church steeples, gathering place. Why do we gather at all? Why do we sing those hymns? Why do we do this about our faith? Why do we tell others about Jesus? This is what teaching the stand is all about. If you don't do that, they won't know. It's not just by hanging out with you that they learn everything. The priests put up a memorial stones when they cross over as a sign of their obedience to the Lord. Putting up memorials is a good way to remember where you've been and what great things the Lord has done in your midst. And that's what we teach to our children. Memorials of this nature help us to not repeat the mistakes of the past. God's children didn't want to act without faith as they had 40 years earlier. Notice, please, that they were incredibly careful to teach their children the meaning of this memorial. Sometimes we're good at teaching rituals without conveying to the world the meaning. That's what's wrong with some of the liturgy and worship in churches. Everything is done for the congregants in the holy huddle while the average pagan or even the children of the saints look on with absolutely no registering, a puzzlement on their faces. Teaching the sand has to do with communicating the God in the middle of our ritual. Don't just do the ritual. Don't just show up at church. Help the children understand why we're doing that. Crossing over Jordan on dry land is an exciting event in the life of a whole nation. It's like the shot heard around the world in colonial America. It's like the wall coming down in Berlin. It's like watching the statue of Saddam Hussein in Baghdad being pulled over by people with ropes, people who've been set free. No matter who the pastor is in any church, you take a stand for Christ and teach that stand to your children and to the community, the community of faith, certainly, but also the larger community. Tell others why we do what we do. So take a stand and teach the stand. And the third principle is remarkably simple, but rarely done. You must not stand still. 
Too often we let the stones, those things God has done for us, and even the accomplishments that we have made, we let the stones keep us chained to yesterday. Uh, beloved, God never sanctified sitting on our blessed assurance. <laughs> Note, if you will, in Joshua 4, in verse 8, it says that the men did as Joshua had commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan River, one for each tribe, just as the Lord had told Joshua. They carried them to the place where they camped for the night and constructed the memorial there. Now, memorials are for seeing. They need to be seen. First, we see them to remember. Then, we see them in the rearview mirror. You know, it's impossible to go forward when you're looking backward. You bump into things that way, right? They prepared for spiritual warfare, and so should we. Joshua 4.13, these armed men, about 40,000 strong, were ready for battle, and the Lord was with them as they crossed over to the plains of Jericho, city of Jericho. Spiritual warfare is done with the gospel of peace, with righteousness, truth, the shield of faith, helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. You remember this, when it was time for the walls of Jericho to come down, God did not tell them to pick up the swords and fight. They were to carry a light and some horns and make some noise. That's all, and they walked around Jericho once a day for six days, and on the seventh day, they walked around it seven times. And when they shouted and they lifted the lights, the walls came down. They didn't do it. God did it. They also responded to the upward call, and so should we. Joshua 4, verse 16 says, Command the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant to come up out of the riverbed. Once you've laid down the memorial stones, you've taken up the tools of warfare. There's nothing left to do but to move out in faith. They responded to the upward call. Scripture tells us in chapter 5, verse 1, that when God's people did those things, all the enemies that they faced, their hearts melted. They looked at the people who were being obedient to God, and they said, oh man, this is not going to be pretty for us. God gave victory to the people who did things his way. So the question comes to us uh, on this morning, I guess, how shall we lay down the stones that we have here? What stones are you talking about? Well, in the ancient world, stones were used for a lot of different purposes. They were used to build altars, such as the monument Joshua. Joshua had the priest construct as a symbol of their united purpose. Stones were also used to build dwelling places in that day for families to be protected and knit together. And sadly, stones were also used to kill those who violated important laws. They called it stoning. It certainly can be that way in church life also. We're no different than the people who marched in circles in the desert for 40 years. It can be that way in church life, where you work, in families, friends, neighbors. Um, today, we don't use stones much for physical buildings or for monuments or for even executions, but we do have some things that we need to lay down. Uh, our will, for instance, and our pride and our tongue, stones with which we can and do destroy each other. This is one set of stones that we can lay down with confession and obedience to the word of God. Now, we shared in our baptismal renewal moments ago uh, and we were asked, each one of us was asked to recall our baptism and uh, be thankful. To be thankful is a mark of obedience. And uh, so I would like to take us back there for just a second. I'd like, I'd like for you to go back to that water for just a second. I would like for you in your mind to go back to the Jordan River where that water was and where it had parted, where they were standing on dry ground. And I want you to imagine you're standing just off the Jordan's riverbank. The water is gone. It's a miracle. There's nothing but dry riverbed and stones all around. I want you to imagine you have reached down and you picked up one of those stones, and now you hold it in your hand. I want you to picture it as representative of the power that each of us possesses to do one of two things, to either stone our neighbor or to build an altar to God, to build something for that neighbor. 
Now I want you to, to see that stone as a building block for God's house. God's house of prayer and love. How do you build that with stones? Well, thank God for the opportunity that he has given you to be strong and courageous. Mark this moment. Mark the moment of your baptism when you became part of God's family. And if you've never been baptized, that's on the table for you. You come, you talk to us, we'll take care of that. But thank God for the opportunity he's given you through your baptism, through becoming part of God's church, God's forever family, to be strong and courageous, just like he gave the opportunity to the Israelites. And as you offer that prayer, you're offering a prayer of thankfulness, which is a mark of obedience. You've honored God's will by agreeing to lay down the stones and receive his grace, and then to extend that grace to others. Let me encourage you, people of God, take a stand for Christ. Teach that stand to your family and to the community, and then don't stand still. Lay down the stones, pick up the tools of spiritual warfare, and move out, move up, and on for Christ. We're beginning a new calendar year. Let this memorial of laying down our stones where the water used to be, and let it be to us a strong and continuing sign and bow before God that this church, your church, will move forward standing for much better than pride and selfishness and self-will. We've chosen to stand strong and be courageous for the crucified and risen King of Kings. We do this for Christ's sake. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray together. Father, your people standing in the Jordan on dry ground with stones all around, that's a choice we face every day. It's the choice to build or to break down or just to sit still and stare as others do what we should be doing. Help us to take a stand. Help us to teach the stand and never be found standing still when you have said, go possess the land. For the glory and the honor and praise to which you alone are worthy, O Lord, we pray in the name of the Son, cooperating with the Spirit, to honor and exalt the majesty of the Father. Let it be so, we pray, in each of our lives. Amen.
today. Folks, thank you so much for worshiping with us today. We appreciate it. We invite you to uh, share your prayer requests with us. We would love to pray for you. And we invite you to share your comments with us. Or if you'd like to investigate becoming part of our fellowship, we would love to talk with you. Use the contact information you'll see on the screen in just a moment. God bless yeah. you.